Thanks for changing all our lives. So in love with you. It's a big part of our mission, not only to become a home for artists, but also a home for culture and culture building. Another way in which you've been a home for culture is through our education program. We're training young kids of color to run our cultural institutions of tomorrow. The Apollo has helped me fully realize my love of the entertainment industry. This place has showed me that there's no limits to what I can do. Hi, and welcome to Apollo Education's career panel, Cinematography Shifting the Looking Glass. My name is Jason Sear, Associate Director for Career and Workforce Development here at the Apollo. For more than 87 years, the Apollo has been a space to celebrate life, to witness, to grieve, to address some of the most pressing issues of our time. Even though the Apollo's physical doors have not been open over the last year, the work hasn't stopped. We have continued in the digital space with free programs such as tonight's career panel that will edify, educate, and uplift you guys listening. I hope you'll consider making a donation in support of this free of our free vital programs to ensure that our theater has a long lasting um, life. Please donate at www.apollotheater org forward slash donate. Since March, the education program has continued to work hard to bring our activities and events to a wider audience through distance learning for teachers and students, electronic resources and events that amplify young voices and discussions like the one we're going to share with you this evening. I want to thank um, everybody that's going to you'll see today. Um, we're super happy about bringing you a, collective, a collection of cinematographers and innovators who will take you behind the scenes of their work while sharing their journey, as well as providing you with advice and guidance on the different paths that exist within the entertainment industry. But before that even happens, um, the education career panels have featured interviews and panel discussions with theater, music, and media industry professionals focus on highlighting the behind the scenes professions in the arts and entertainment industry. Um, I'm super excited about being able to prevent you, provide you or send to you. I'm excited to hand this event over to our moderator for this evening, uh, Mr. Christian Epps. Uh, Mr. Christian Epps is the founder and CEO of Lights, Camera, Actions, um, Diaspora, uh, LA, based social enterprise nonprofit. His career with it as a light designer has spanned over three decades, ranging from major motion pictures, broadcast television, commercials, live theater, dance, music, um, and special events. He's worked with directors like Ava DuVernay, Spike Lee, and Hype Williams, as well as talent like First Lady Michelle Obama, Whitney Houston, and Kevin Hart. He's recently Worked on movies that we all saw last year, enjoyed Sylvie's Love, Lovecraft Country, as well as Beyonce's um, Black is King. I am happy to introduce, and I want my audience who are watching and listening to give it up for Mr. Christian Epps.
Hi, Christian. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Doing I'm great. so happy that you're here. I know. I know that you've been. You're actually on location now, and you filming yes. your next project. And we really appreciate you giving us your time tonight. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so before we start our discussion, I, I would like you to really which could land our audience and give our audience some context into what they can anticipate tonight. Um, so my question for you is, what is a cinematographer? So um, a cinematographer is a, on a basic level is a person who's in charge of the camera. That, and we could, that's the basic idea. Uh, the, the way it plays out in reality is there's several different ways. So you might be working on a film or a television show and be the cinematographer who decides the visuals, what lens, what lighting, how we're going to move the camera around. Uh, you might be in a more documentary space where you are documenting, uh, you know, the sort of sit down interview content mm -hmm. thing, or, uh, or you might be documenting other aspects of life that are much more energetic and broad and uh, vast. Uh, you might be an artist who uses a camera in a sort of creative, uh, art installation sort of way, but uh, mm -hmm. either way, you're in charge of the camera and you sometimes work with people, uh, with a crew, with directors, with costume designers. Uh, sometimes you work alone. It's a little bit of art and a little bit of technical. Okay, I've learned something new. Um, yeah. I can't wait to hear the rest of the, the rest, the more, I can't wait to hear the, what I will learn this evening. So Excellent. thank you so much. Um, I'll let you Excellent. take it away. Very good. Uh, so we have three cinematographers who you're going to meet tonight, uh, all who have their own unique way of looking at uh, the world through their lenses, as we like to say. Um, and what we'll, who we'll start with on this go round is uh, Glenn Contave. Glenn is an activist, a performance artist, a social entrepreneur. Uh, Glenn uses his camera in immersive technology. Uh, to highlight narratives of the oppressed. Let's take a look at some of his work. Glenn, welcome. That was really nice stuff. We are glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. And next up, we have Amir Filzami. Uh, Amir, Amir is an artist and a cinematographer from Queens. Amir's recent work uh, includes visuals for the 20th anniversary of Jill Scott's seminal Who is Jill Scott album. And uh, let's have a quick look at some of his work. Amir, hello. <laughs> Welcome. We're also glad to have you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, next up, Ayana Baraka. Ayana is a documentarian, uh, a cinematographer, and a content creator. Ayana's work has seen her off to Sundance and to Broadway, and we can't wait to hear from her. But first, Ayana, we're going to take a little bit of a look at some of your work.
Excellent. Ayana, welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you all here. So, uh, so Glenn, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my medium of choice is uh, 360 camera and immersive XR technology uh, in general. Um, and I started off doing that through um, going to various protests and especially given the fact that there are so many people that can't leave their immediate environments. Um, mm. I, I saw power in being able to bring people to an environment and see perspectives that they wouldn't ordinarily see due to their, you know, their social media algorithms or to their social networks. Um, and so like, I feel like a, um, as a country, we don't know how to talk to each other. We're often screening into a void and right. uh, immersive technology gives you the power to circumvent a lot of the, the white noise and just put you put yourself directly into uh, a new space. And so, especially given what was going on with Donald Trump, um, I saw value in, in capturing events that were going not going to be repeated through what I, I see as the medium of the future. Ah, that's beautiful and long lasting and impactful. Thank you. Uh, Amir, yes. you're next. Tell us a little bit about you and, and how you see yourself in the industry. Um, so uh, I, my entrance into filmmaking was uh, pretty non-traditional in the sense that um, I uh, just kind of had an interest in filmmaking, used to watch a lot of films. Um, but for a long time, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Um, and I used to shadow physicians and I worked in the ER at Bellevue Hospital here in New York. And um, I had just a series of experiences where I had conversations with patients that um, really, really kind of like shifted my perspective and what I <laughs> thought I wanted to do and what I thought was important. And I found that I was more invested in people's stories um, than I was in the science. And um, I felt like that was, a, was a, it wasn't a good quality for a doctor. And so, I started to just lean into that um, and explain that, I mean, uh, excuse me, um, explore that more. And um, I ultimately, you know, bought a camera and I used to shoot a lot of photography, good amount of street photography. And um, ultimately um, I uh, started out as a PA, then a set photographer, and then uh, made my intentions known to the camera people that I met on set and um, I was welcomed on set. So, yeah. Nice. Excellent. Uh, Ayana, what is your story? Sure. Um, I started my career in New York as an Aerie camera prep tech. And then in 2012, I became Local 600 Union Qualified. But instead, I moved to Los Angeles, where I received my master's in cinematic arts from USC. While attending, I took many, many jobs, like many jobs, as additional cinematographer on feature documentaries. And by the time I graduated, one of the features was shortlisted for an Oscar. Another was nominated for an Emmy. Al Jazeera turned um, one of the USC shorts that I did into a feature. And I lent my first feature documentary for BET International starting in Denai Guerrera and Lupita Nyong'o a year after that. Wow. So you came out the gate strong. I had to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, very nice. So. Let's take a look at some of these strong visuals that you're talking about. Can we do that? I think we have a piece of footage to show. Yeah. Interesting cinematography there. Um, so you're welcome. Thank you, uh, Glenn. Um, why is cinematography important? There's a lot of reasons why. I'd say, I'd say that the the main thing for me has always been about just access. Um, the fact that the fact that you know whether you're in Mogadishu, Somalia, or in Greenwich, Connecticut, you can literally 
um, hear the story of someone from halfway around the world and, you know, at least get a step closer to what, what would ideally be a conversation. Uh, but the beauty of that is that if you have the right people that are in the room creating the experience for you, yes. um, you're getting authentic voices and you're getting uh, a real distilled version of another aspect of the human experience you've been normally exposed to. Mm. That shows up in your work, how you make a point uh, not just to tell a story that is fictional, but to actually <laughs> <to imagine. laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's Glenn, because Glenn is actually uh, living uh, uh, living this moment. Uh, he's out in the field um, doing his work, and so he's got some environmental stuff to deal with, and we're happy to deal with that as well, because we need your input, Glenn. Uh, Amir, uh, what would you say is the role of a cinematographer when you're in a collaborative environment? So I would say that the role of a cinematographer, uh, first and foremost, is to listen, um, to be present. Um, we have the sometimes complex role of balancing uh, the technical and the artistic, and um, we're translators in a way. And so I think it's super important that cinematographers understand the importance of being just present and understanding uh, how to kind of be um, flexible and shift to the needs of a particular project. If uh, something needs to be a little dark, um, then you might have to lean into that darkness and um, yeah. embrace that. You know, if something um, is bright, I think you have to kind of embody that as well and be of that mindset. Um, so I think it, it really varies per project, but it really, in my experience, I think it's important to be present and to really not make it about what I always think is right, but what um, a director needs or whomever you know I'm collaborating with. So you're you're an interpreter in that in that aspect. Yeah, um, and I think you know we're, we're human, right? So like we're never gonna not have our own thoughts about things and you know feelings about things. And I think that's always going to come through in our work. If, but I think it's a balance of um, interpreting, but also being grounded in what you, you know, how you live, how you see things. And, yeah. Contributing to that, uh, taking in their input from your collaborative team and also right. interpreting with your right. own vision, adding to that. That's nice. That's nice. Excellent. Very nice. Um, Ayana, so some of your work, I know, includes a certain amount of equipment and and planning. Uh, some of the stuff we just saw in that recent clip was yours. Um, can you speak a little bit about the types of equipment and that you deal with and give our audience a little sense of, of some aspect of that life? Sure. Um, so I'll speak to that clip specifically because we just saw it. that one. We used the Airy Alexa Plus XT with um, Cook anamorphic lenses. And then we also had a drone to supplement um, some of those shots. But generally, um, I know or I've used every camera, I think, that has ever <laughs> been invented. Um, mm -hmm. And lighting equipment, too. It, it just ranges from, like, practicals all the way up to, like, airy lights and... Um, theater lights. Um, but yeah, for that shot, we use the Airy Alexa Plus with anamorphic lenses. And when you say practicals, what is that? Our audience doesn't necessarily speak. Oh, yes. Language. Um, so practicals are just um, lamps and lights that are um, at a location. So like a lamp or um, a fixture that's already, it already, already exists within the environment. Excellent. Like your lamp at home or your wall scot or the office lights or whatever. Yes. Right. Nice. So so the shot that you that we saw, can you talk to us a little bit about the planning aspect of it and how how you deal with planning to make this thing happen? Because there's a bunch of equipment and you have an idea. And how do you as a cinematographer 
get us to uh, the finish line? Sure. So the planning stage is actually my f most favorite aspect of besides shooting. Um, but like, I love planning. Um, it's my favorite part of the process because it allows me to distill my ideas so that I'm able to communicate my intended visual message. Um, I really dove with that last shot. I really dove into every aspect of the visual language from like who's POV, the color, the movement. Um, I did camera tests um, with the camera package at the location um, and mm -hmm. monitored because it was outside. So I monitored the sun path and um, where the shadows were going to be for each location. Um, the director, Skinner Myers, and I do, um, would drive out to that location, which was like way, way, way out in the desert. Like if you're from LA, you'll probably get this reference, but it was like way past Joshua Tree. Um, we would drive out there every weekend for six months prior to the shoot um, to find our locations uh, and to plan out our shots. And I'll just give you an example of when planning came in handy. Mm -hmm. um, I was like wanting this shot. So <clears throat> we drove off of like the road and got stuck in the sand and there was no cell phone reception. There were rattlesnakes. Um, we tried to flag down the four by fours that were out there, but they couldn't, the, the folks couldn't hear us. So finally Skinner got his son's like little baby plastic shovel <laughs> and started digging his car out and, and it worked. So that wow. was good. Um, but testing allowed us to keep our team safe, move quickly, troubleshoot issues, like all the issues that always pop up on every set. And that mm -hmm. allowed us to be thoughtful about what we captured on the day of the shoot, um, which that shoot took two days. Wow. And when you're doing that sort of stuff, um, that sounds either dangerous, fun, creative, like uh, there's a jumble of things you mentioned. Uh, how do you figure out which projects to say yes to, to take on, to like throw yourself into? Um, well, like <clears throat> my, my aim is to shoot impactful, memorable stories that resonate, change beliefs, are um, timeless, inspire, have truth. Um, my hope is that people walk away from the stories I filmed and are more aware of the world and their place in the world. I want people to, 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 to feel seen and to empathize with others. Um, and I'm also all about like preserving history. So if it has that, then like those are the ones that I, I'll work on. Preserving history. Anything particular yep. about that you want to mention? So much to play, <laughs> my baby. Um, so uh, Greenwood Avenue is a project that I had been working on for several years, um, which was which is about Black Wall Street and the race massacre of 1921. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's like the part of me preserving history. <laughs> nice, nice. I think we have another clip of yours. That was yours, yes? Yes. And that was that part of Greenwood? What was that? That was La Tela del, del Soto. <clears throat> so that was also um, the piece that was directed by Skinner Myers. Oh, that was the desert one in Joshua Tree? Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, Amir, I've got a similar question for you. Uh, but we want to take a little uh, look at a little bit of your footage before we do that. Some of your BTS work and then the final footage. Okay. Go ahead, tell us about that piece. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, that is a, a scene um, that's part of this film, this documentary, feature documentary um, that I uh, worked on called Two Gods. And uh, Two Gods is about um, a casket maker from New York, New Jersey, um, who's Muslim. And um, the film is about him as a person, but it's also um, juxtaposes kind of the work, you know, the struggle that comes with the work that he does. Um, and um, that particular shot, I don't think the BTS was actually showed, but yeah. um, that particular shot, just to give you um, some background. So uh, there we go. So <laughs> um, Hanif, the main character, um, throughout the course of, of the film is really uh, struggling with um, as, a, as like a middle-aged man, his, his goals and how he ultimately didn't really end up where he wanted to be, um, but also feeling a sense of responsibility with the weight of the work that he's doing. And um, he uses uh, casket making as a way to mentor uh, uh, young men in his neighborhood and particularly two young men. And um, the director is Ishan. So I came in at the, towards the end of the process of that film um, as an additional cinematographer. And uh, the director, Zishan Ali, um, had like years worth of uh, verite footage. And he um, was like at a certain stage in the edit where he was just like, I, it, this is like, it's just not hitting. And he wanted uh, to incorporate scenes that were more composed that broke up the verite and provided mm -hmm the audience with the opportunity to kind of meditate on what was actually happening. Cause there's mm, just a lot cool. of, lot going on. And so that shot that you uh, just saw, the BTS shot um, was based off of a conversation that Zishan and I had where um, we wanted to reflect Tani Center's struggle and his confusion. And so we have a piece of plexiglass there um, you know, attached to a C stand and like a cartilating clamp. And um, what we did was we put the camera, um, I believe we used a Ursa Mini uh, 4.6K, and um, we just placed the camera on a Dana Dolly, which you can't really see there. But um, we just like slowly pushed in um, on that uh, because we, we wanted it, yes, to be poetic, but also not heavy handed and to not get in the way of uh, what was already, you know, this, the film kind of speaks for itself um, because it's just such strong verite. So we just wanted to really provide uh, the audience with a, a moment of um, like solace to just like meditate and sit with this character and reflect with this character. Nice. And so the that frosted plexiglass is part of, uh, can you say, speak to that one individual so, element? Yeah, so that plexiglass is really, um, supposed to reflect like his confusion and the parts of him that are just unclear of his path. Um, and that's why you see him sitting behind that glass and just in reflection uh, because, you know, you can see him, but it's still a bit unclear. Fantastic. That's cool. Uh, so Glenn, let me talk to you for a moment. Uh, so you work as an activist, right? Uh, how has that impacted your work? Can, can you speak to being an activist and being a filmmaker or documentarian? Because those are two different things. You could just be an activist, not necessarily a filmmaker. How do you see blending the two? Use that, give us some sense of your, your approach. Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of, there are documentarians whose, whose goal is explicitly to inform the public and have the public come to their conclusions about specific issues while hmm. activists engage in advocacy with specific goals and an agenda. And so my agenda uh, throughout has been the liberation of black and brown people um, and reducing suffering for oppressed people in different ways. And so uh, the intention in terms of how I'm fusing it with uh, cinematography specifically is to hit at a, a deep question like 2016, 2016 happened, like half of my friends in New York had no idea that Donald Trump was going to win because um, mm -hmm. none, of their, none of their friends, none of their social networks, none of their media platforms like delivered that message to them, right? 
Right. Um, and then a lot of people, mainly like mainstream white America, started to mobilize. Um, on a deeper level, a lot of uh, like black and brown folks are have already have historically been um, overrepresented overrepresented in terms of every level of oppression in this country are starting to be like, yeah, you know, this has been an ongoing problem. Our problems have been exacerbated. Um, but like, how do we bring this to the forefront and like, like channel this energy towards meaningful, sustainable change? And so I felt as if my role was to capture all of this pent up energy that was happening and then to use uh, 360 in general to start facilitating, facilitate meaningful conversations. Because we did a lot of A-B testing, A-B testing in terms of like, um, showing our work at like a riot or a white lives matter rally and then showing yeah. similar content to what you would see on like your instagram feed right yeah. one of the things that would that our main takeaways were is that like you know as people were desensitized to a lot of information from those platforms but through the novelty of this medium like one main difference was people had to like take off their headsets and actually needed a second to reset readjust come back to and then the feedback the the feedback, the types of questions that they were asking um, was completely different from the norm. Um, so I guess as an activist, yes, I'm pushing for I'm pushing for specific goals and agendas, but then also as a cinematographer, I'm working as a guide um, to have some meaningful conversations and really try and filter out the white noise. Wow, that's a fascinating work and very, very important on a, on a social and national level. Uh, I think you have a piece we'd love to take a look at. It's very important along those lines. Anticipation. I thought about older generations before me that were continuously plagued by the terrorist acts of the Ku Klux Klan. I thought about my place in history and our place in history and the fact that in 2017, we still have to deal with this. And the bottom line is, when you have a society where you have groups of people come out in torches in defense of a statue, when my brothers and sisters are shot down daily, daily. What does that mean? Mm. Thank you. You are in the thick of it. That's great. That's great. Um, can you speak about the 360 cameras just a little bit more? Because you, most of us are familiar to some degree with cameras, but not necessarily the 360 approach. Let's really, really make sure the audience gets your perspective or value in that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so with the pieces that you saw, they were shot with uh, two different types. Um, one was the Samsung Gear VR. It's a, it's a fisheye lens. And so it's a fisheye like 180 lens. It captures like basically 180 degrees right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And then one in the back, um, one in the back that does the same thing. And what's pretty smooth about it is it has uh, an auto stitch, an auto stitching feature, um, mm. where you don't have to spend time, spend too much time like stitching the seams all together. I'm sure Ayana could tell you a lot about that uh, <laughs> with her work as well. Um, and then, um, and a little bit, a little bit, a little bit later on, there was also the the Rico Theta, um, also has like a, a on the lens, but uh, the quality was up. It's a 4K lens. Um, but one thing, I mean, there's there's also like GoPro rigs, um, which is like 18 cameras that are like put together. Um, you need a higher a higher budget for it, but there's pros and cons to each side. But what, one thing that I find especially interesting about VR, um, not just now, but for thinking in the future, especially um, for you all who are thinking, considering like trying to enter a career in the immersive space, is the fact that like the naked eye sees everything in 9.6K. So like 9600 uh, uh, pixels per millimeter, right? There's 8K headsets, VR headsets already. So once we get to a point where you can have 9.6K headsets, you can create environments that are like visually indistinguishable from our current reality, while at the same time, you don't have the rules that are going to to physics. So I think that's where it gets really interesting in itself. And like that, if we're talking about like, um, going into abstraction and reimagining new worlds and not just talking about like the present, um, it gets to a level where like, you see in like, you know, um, insane like brick and Morty type of, type of animations. Um, but you can have a social justice cause like entrenched within it. Um, 
so yeah, those are some of my thoughts in terms of why I'm interested in the media. Wow. Uh, Ayana, Glenn touched a little bit on the, I'll say as an amateur, three-dimensional aspect of it. Can you speak to how you see that, how, why you use that, what it means to you? It means to me, <clears throat> you mean like working in 360 as opposed to working in traditional? Yeah, you do a VR work, and, I, and I'm and i an amateur in that, so please explain to myself and our audience um, your how you overlap with Glenn and, and what that multidimensional world means. Sure. So I, <coughs> sorry, my throat is just so dry. Um, so I, um, my first VR project was um, Greenwood Avenue, a virtual reality experience. And um, I, so, okay, I'll tell you how, the project came about and then that'll kind of inform the reason why I used VR as opposed to traditional. So I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Olivia J. Hooker, one of the last known survivors of the Tulsa Riggs Massacre and also an advocate for reparations. Um, I felt that um, I wanted to share my experience meeting her with other people because it was such an eye-opening experience for me. <clears throat> um, well, I don't know if people are familiar, but um, Tulsa is kind of like a, a microcosm of, um, of of what's happening in Black communities across the U.S. Um, um, when uh, Dr. Hooker was a child, it was an affluent community and a, a highly educated community, a diverse community. Um, and Dr. Hooker embodied grace and strength and her spirit was infectious. So I wanted to share what it was like for me to sit across from her and have her orate her story to me, like orate this history to me. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that I don't think I would have been able to capture um, traditionally. Like, like sitting in the same space, like looking into someone's eyes and then have them mm -hmm. tell you their story. See you, see you. Um, it took years for this project to get off the ground, um, partly because people thought we were past um, talking about racism. Mm. Um, and it ended up being, I re released it last year with everything that was going on. I was gonna save it for the centennial of the race massacre, which is, which, um, is coming up in uh, May, June. But it ended up being um, a scripted five part series <clears throat> Um, virtual reality series that you can find on YouTube. Um, oh, exactly. so we can all watch it, huh? Yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone's free to watch it. <clears throat> ah, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize. Okay, excellent. Um, can we take a look at that clip? Would you? Over a boy and a girl and an elevator. It never was about the elevator. Us. The we're wow, congratulations. Thank you. So that piece you said took five years to develop, to get going? To develop, but then, <clears throat> well, to get the money, it took about um, almost three years. And then we wrote it and shot it. And then <laughs> the first part, took about a year and then like getting it out took like another year for some reason. <laughs> Phenomenal. Uh, that's a great, independent uh, project. That shows a great amount of uh, determination and follow through that cinematographers need at times. That's great. Um, can you speak a little bit, if you would, as the only woman on the panel, what, uh, how that has any kind of impact or do, does it? I does it? And if so, what kind of impact have you found that that has? Um, some of our audience will no doubt be women and, and some will be younger and wondering if, you know, how that plays into their interest. <clears throat> so I think it's important for women to know what roles exist and um, that they can exist within those roles or these roles. 
um, especially in immersive technology, we're at a point where we are able to create a culture of inclusion, which is different from the film industry because the culture has already been established. What you see now are a lot of initiatives uh, to diversify Hollywood, whereas with immersive, we are or we have the opportunity to create um, like every aspect of creation from like writing the script to distribution. Like literally there are no pipelines currently that exist mm -hmm. for immersive. So we have opportunity to create those pipelines. And mm -hmm. it's really important for women to understand what's happening and also get involved, even if it's like baby steps, um, like, like um, attending tech conferences tech conferences like PBS TechCon, SitGraph, um, Oculus Connect, um, where you can go and just like take in all of what's being invented right now. Um, I went to my first Oculus Connect and had the opportunity to put on a VR headset. And right. in the headset or in the environment, you had hands. And um, for me, it was profound because it was a, a satisfying experience. I felt like I was in the same space with other people. Um, like I laughed and it was like, it was fun. And I think it was like at that point that I realized that immersive was the future. Um, nice. um, so, to, but I also wanna speak to the challenges of um, being a female DP or like the, the, the challenges that female DPs face in trad mm -hmm. traditional uh, media because at the day still a technical role and I remember um, you know people asking me technical questions um, and I'd give an answer and they turn around and ask like my male counterpart as if like mm -hmm. I didn't just train this dude <laughs> mm, right, right. Um, right. and I used to question myself like am I wrong or um, like, like almost to the point where like now I struggle with correcting men on set. Like even when I know I'm right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and I'm working on that, but like it's important yeah. for that we acknowledge or we unapologetically take up space. And um, I've had yeah. to learn to advocate for myself and for like the rates um that align right. with my skills in these technical right. spaces immerse and that's the challenge of, of women being paid less etc that yeah. that is also a challenge here that is yet to be uh, fully overcome yeah interesting uh hey glenn um can you talk a little bit about the technology that we have in our hand, which kind of overlaps with your work at times. Uh, most everybody these days in, in these environments have a cell phone. Um, can you speak a little bit about how they can be used in, in our current era? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, it, it informs my, my role as an activist and as a creative. Um, as an activist, I mean, like, it's the cell phones essentially become armor in the sense that, um, you know, there are so many situations, especially that I put myself in where we're confronting police um, or we're in riots, riot type of situations and you need to be able to, to record or to live stream or to gather evidence, whatever the case may be. So that armor is, um, is critical. Uh, you look at, I'd be remiss not to, not to mention today, what, the fact that Derek Chauvin is going to go to jail for the murder of George Floyd because it was caught on camera. Like, these actions were never caught By a young camera. woman, none, nonetheless. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, armor from that perspective is critical. Um, and then on the other side of things, um, another immersive medium that um, I spend a lot of time with is augmented reality um, through the smartphones. And so, one limitation of 360 video is, is hardware accessibility. But with cell phones, most Americans have them. Um, right. I doubt there's someone in the audience right now that doesn't have a, that doesn't have a smartphone. And so, um, especially in terms of intentionality of XR, um, yeah. like, like what I was saying before with, with 360 is that, you know, we're, we're um, capturing events that won't be repeated to the media in the future and transporting people in different ways. With augmented reality, what we're doing um, is where in, we can insert narratives and specifically statues in ways that haven't been done before. And so 
mm. a nonprofit, an ed tech nonprofit. We're called Movers and Shakers NYC. And our mission is that we use augmented reality to write black and brown history into American curricula. And we started off trying to remove statues like the racist statue of Christopher Columbus, the Columbus Circle. And when we right. did all these different advocacy campaigns, um, like the mayor didn't want to do it. The governor made, made it a landmark. And I have, I have too much to do to like pull down a statue and then go to jail. So right. what we did is we started creating this collection of digital monuments of black and brown figures you don't learn about in school. And you can just place them in your home. You can place them in public space. And you right, can do it right, with right. or without permission and circumvent a lot of this red tape, this red tape and these processes. And then we're also just trying to open schools. So that's, those are other ways we're using our, our films as well. Can we take a look at a clip of your work in that area? There was a phalanx of shields and sticks and riot gear, people from tear gas, someone through a mailbox, I saw a hammer, I saw clear indications of assault and battery. So um, what you saw there was was um, from the riots at Charlottesville in Virginia. Yes. Um, the augmented reality work is an, it's an app online, you can check it out, it's called Kinfolk, Kinfolk AR. Um, yeah, yeah, just yeah. check it out there. But uh, from what you just saw, like there's another serious example of just like using your cell phone in a situation where you're not sure of your safety. Um, and so, like on the day of the riots themselves, uh, it was like 9:30 a.m. Yeah. and people came back with blood all over their faces. Um, and you know, you have to ask yourself if you're going to put yourself in a situation where you're going to have traditional interviews. Like it was my intention uh, before understanding what Charlottesville was, but I mean, even from the night before, like we had to do an emergency evacuation from the church that we were in because there were Nazis with tiki torches and we thought they were going to come to church. Yeah, serious business. Right? Yeah, and um, I'm saying a lot to say that like, once it was time to go in, you saw the tea, all the tear gas and everything going on, like my role shifted to just like recording everything, keeping my head on the swivel and just capturing this Thank event you. for others to see. Right. Um, and then the final final thing I'll share with you in terms of just cell phones is um, this this uh, one of the Nazis came from like behind the military formation, yeah. um, started cursing me out, called me the M word, whatever. And I'm just like, okay. And he goes, what? You don't know how to fight? Like trying to provoke a fight? And meanwhile, CNN, BBC, like every major news outlet yeah. you can imagine is just like facing you. And so obviously, like as a black man, I'm wrong. So I'm, touching him first. So I turned on the camera and I said, no, actually I'm doing a documentary trying to capture different perspectives, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, Would you want to do an interview? And then he calmed down from being ready to maul me with his friends with like the AK-47s behind him to yeah. saying, okay, I'll do it. And then I said, state your okay. name, where you're from and why you do what you do. And he said, I'm not telling you shit. And he just ran away. That's and that was, it was really, really so. That's yeah. amazing. And, and so there's a particular angle for BIPOC people and, and how that, same safety is one thing, but in this particular time in 2020, uh, where it has a, a, a unique value, I shouldn't say 2020, but in this era, when it has a specific interest, a specific tool uh, for safety uh, around some of the uh, black and brown uh, persons of color interests. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, Amir, can I ask you a question, sir? Um, sure. I'm really interested in how people like the three of you and others in the industry can move in a way to empower communities. Um, can you speak a little bit about that sort of thought, how we can work together, join forces, anything that, any suggestions or ideas you have around that? Sure thing. Um, I think community is really, really kind of vital for uh, practitioners of color, I think we ultimately, I, I, I think it's pretty simple, actually. It's a matter of finding people who have similar interests to you and um, just being open and honest about uh, what you want to do, what you have, and how you can share it with one another. Um, one example in my life, um, I have a group of friends um, all men of color um, who are cinematographers and um, 
you know, we run camera tests together. Um, we uh, share light equipment. Um, we, if someone is like reading an article and comes across something, we share it with one another. If I have a photo book, I share it with, with someone. And, uh, you know, I think that in many ways is, is really goes a long way um, in just creating a foundation where people know that they have like-minded individuals around them um, who have similar interests. And what that, what hopefully that also does is create a space where you guys can vent with one another um, and talk about your experiences. Um, community has been really, really important in my journey in the sense that, um, you know, when I was coming up, I, I, like I said, I didn't come up, but, you know, department in the traditional way. And so I had to find people um, who uh, would give me a chance and yeah. who were also interested in being like friends and colleagues. And um, I was honest about the fact that I wanted to be a DP. I was honest about what I didn't know. And I think that um, when people see that in you, um, ho hopefully <laughs> they're willing to invest in it. And, and help you. And um, I would not be where I am and I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had this far had I not, um, you know, just been straight up with people and um, right. been intentional and open and honest about like, hey, I want to be your friend and I want to build community with you and I want to make films similar to like what Ayana was saying. Like, I really want to make things that uh, have like a historical significance um, that have an impact on people that make people think about themselves. Right. Um, and I think, uh, right, right. You, know, you know, finding folks who, who are interested in those things is, is really important. And I think right. as black people, we often want to tell those stories because those are our experiences. Um, so it shouldn't be hard. And we have technology, you know, we have. That's right. Uh, Ayana, Glenn, can either of you mention particular organizations or groups or ways in which you have partnered or that you can suggest to our audience uh, how we can grow our networks? Now, Ayana, I know your project took a, long, a lot of support, so you could just jump right on in there. Sure. Um, so. <clears throat> I had partnerships with Black Public, public Media, um, partnerships mm -hmm. with YouTube, Google, had partnerships with um, the Greenwood Cultural Center, the 1921 Race Master Commission, the um, John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation. So basically, um, I mean, I really feel like the, the, the Greenwood Avenue was made by everyone. Um, like the, our partnerships, everyone was just like collectively involved with making this project. Like we shot in Tulsa, like the community came out to be extras, to act in it, to be, you know, crew members. So um, partnerships slash friendships. Um, yeah, and just like-minded folks, like people, we're all working towards the same goal. Like we're all, trying to educate, trying to do X, Y, Z. So that's how, that's how we were able to create our partnerships. And, and when you all think about partnering with people, um, give our audience a sense, if you would, of, the, uh, of what we should be looking for, because you'll be somebody sitting in our audience who wants, to, who wants to expand their world, but they don't necessarily know who to go to or what sorts of organizations or people. Or, yeah, give us some direction on some things we might look for. So are you speaking to collaboration on projects in particular or finding like folks who are? That's a good question. Uh, what, both technically, because what I'm really asking is for audience members, how do you grow your thing? One way that you need to do it is skill sets, et cetera, but one way is partnerships. So whether it's with individuals or with organizations, any of the above are fine, um, we're, we're hoping to understand a little bit more about how we can actually move tangible sorts of organization, not, not organization because we necessarily, but we want to partner with uh, banking institutions. We want to partner with community or with technical uh, 
what, whatever sorts of things that you think we should be looking for, what you would tell a young filmmaker, go out and find a person who does this, a company who does that. Give us some ideas. Um, yeah. You want to tackle that? <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to say, like, <clears throat> I remember early in my career, and, and even now, um, I'm sorry, my son is crying in the background. I don't know if you can hear him. It's okay. Um, but um, early in my, right now, there are a bunch of collectives that people can join. But early in my career, I created my own collective just with really? like minded folks, <laughs> as Amir said. Like I would go parties <laughs> and I know you can't do it right in this moment because of the pandemic, but um, I would throw parties with like my folks. Like it was just like a, a space where artists can come together. Like not just filmmakers, but artists in general, artists can come together and exchange ideas and just have like community and just talk and just be like on that, like vibe on that way, like on that level. Um, I don't know if someone has it. Wow, no, that's great. Yeah, I, you, you helped me think about something. Um, <laughs> I would say um, one thing that um, is really, like say you want to shoot a project and uh, you want to, you know, you're coming up and you want to shoot a short film. And you got a couple of people who you've, um, who you've got on board, um, but you need locations, right? Like this is a really specific example you can like i shot a music video um, primarily in a church and um, one of the things that we did our, our director had um you know childhood ties to the church had gone to the church um, his whole life um, his mom was a member of that church and uh we you know told the church we were like hey we'll run a workshop um in this church um for like your youth group um, around filmmaking um and I think particularly when you're coming up, if you don't have the resources, doing something like that where you're bartering um, is really, really uh, valuable. One, you're building a relationship um, with the people right. you know, in that space, but you're also getting what you need out of it. Um, and um, I think thinking about ways, like particularly for us, I think coming from uh, work, because we work in this industry, and there's a way that this industry works in terms of like, how elitist it can be um, and exclusionary it can be. I think it's really dope to just think about how we can barter and how we can um, provide resources to one another um, yeah. in a way where we're not exchanging you know, money um, specifically for folks coming up. Um, I think um, thinking about how you can help a particular organization or space just as much as you need them to help you uh, goes a long way. Uh, Can yeah, I pick you back uh, on that peek back? Because I totally forgot. Oh, I'm so sorry, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, no. If you have something to like completely relate, I can I can jump in after. It's cool. I was gonna say I totally forgot to to mention Sporus, which we're all a part of, and Array Cruise. Um, that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like showing up like is the most important thing that you can do I think like half of the battle is literally is literally showing up so whether it's um for me I try to show up in terms of like like any sort of event that was nearby where there were people that had access to stories or resources I was thinking to I was there introducing myself to everyone um I've done everything from like wear a cow suit during Tribeca VR to like putting on headsets for people um, to like being outside of like VR cinemas trying to bring people in just because I wanted to like be close to the technology. And so even through that, it was like work shit. It's like the, the cameras I was telling you before, uh, telling you all about before, the Theta and the, the Gear VR, they belong to a VR cinema that I uh, was working at at the time. And they, uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, they would just let me use it because I was around so much. Um, and then from there, you know, met content creators and uh, things evolve from there. But it's also like, especially if you're entering into XR, it's such an, an evolving space. There's so many new ideas that are consistently coming in um, that like, yeah, just being around creatives and hearing the ideas and adjusting is great. Um, for the first right. AR project that we did, like 
it, it was about like I saw a book and deconstructed that process as far as in having a necessity for animators and illustrators and technical advisors and then like putting it together in that way. But without yeah. proximity, it wouldn't have been possible. Wow, that's great. That's great. So it's getting time to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you for a little uh, sage advice. Um, anything particular you want to mention, of course, you can throw in that we haven't covered yet. But, uh, let's start, uh, if I may, Ayana, with you. Um, any words of wisdom or special things you want to throw in? Okay. Um, <clears throat> words of wisdom. I would say make a decision. Um, if this is something that you want to do, then do it today. No excuses. Just start. <clears throat> You're going to be terrible. That's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but as a cinematographer, that's how you're able to define your aesthetic is just through creating. So you have to create, you have to be bad. I don't think any one of us would say that we're at a point where we're happy with the work that we're, or rather we're not satisfied with the work that we're creating because we're always, you know, trying to get to that next um, step. There's always something that we can improve. On our, um, and I, I remember someone saying to me in regards to, I'm not an actor, but um, in regards to acting, and it, and it clicked for me as a cinematographer, they said that, um, yeah, you or as a, a directing person, they said, you know, you're able to get a certain reaction um, out of an actor, like whether it be crying or, or X, Y, Z. And I think as a for a director early in their career, they're like, yes, like, you know, the, the actor was able to cry, we were able to pull those emotions out. But right. this person said, like, is that the correct emotion? So I translate that for cinematography, like, you know, creating the images and creating these feelings, but was that the, was that the intended, the intended um, message that you were trying to communicate. So I think I'm always, for me personally, I'm always trying to refine that. And um, and it just takes time. It takes like literally being terrible <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> right. One guy I said, I know recently he said, get your, get your fails up. Like you're gonna try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. And then you'll eventually get better. <laughs> yeah. Right. Amir, last word. Yeah. I have a lot to say. I'll try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Ayana said. I think um, it's important to connect as early as possible to why you, you do this, um, because it's not going to be easy on a lot of days. Um, and that has to guide you um, through those difficult moments and even, you know, those good, those good moments. like. I think I've been having I've been having a lot of conversations with with like my colleagues about uh, voice 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 and um, the only way you get to finding your voice is uh, like Ayanna said like trying and trying and trying. Um, I think finding a mentor is important. Um, someone who is like in a position that you would dream to be in, um, and then also finding a person who's not that far from where you are, um, and just being sincere, um, being conscious of the fact that if you are showing up and you're being honest and you're doing the work of trying to learn um, as best as best as possible and applying that, um, then you know you can't you can't fail. Um, I like I like that. Thank you, uh, Glenn. Last call. I think that too many of us are focused on who we want to be rather than the problems that we want to solve and stories that we need to tell. Mm. So it's all about falling in love with the process itself, right? Like not everything's going to be perfect. We all shoot for these fleeting moments. But that's not what it's about. It's about a pain that hurts so good. Once you find that pain that hurts so good, I think you know you're on track. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we want to thank the Apollo Theater. Uh, Jason, it's on you, babe. Thanks for having us. Everybody on this panel, 
Um, I've learned so much. Um, hopefully you guys have learned, the audience that's been sitting and watching has learned so much. Um, that you've seen something interesting and um, diverse, and you've heard from different voices, and that's part of what we do here at the Apollo, right? We create spaces and platforms in which we can offer our audience um, different voices, as you heard our panel speak to, to listen to, and that's what's important. Um, once again, I want to give it up to Christian, Ayana, Amir, and Glenn for their amazing work and their passion and drive that they have for the work that they do. Here at the Apollo Theater, we're a mission-based nonprofit um, organization. The education department is committed to enhancing the lives of our community in Harlem and beyond. Our organization depends on generous funding and, and donations from foundations and the community at large. Over the past six months, significant tickets and rental revenue has been lost um, due to the closure of our building. And we've had to cancel over 100 programs and performances. I hope by you watching this uh, career panel, um, you are interested in supporting or to continue to support the Apollo Theater. If so, please visit www.apollotheater.org forward slash donate. Uh, please stay tuned to our digital stage events that are coming up in the next days and weeks. Um, next coming up, we actually have an exciting career panel on May 17th called Footprint, all about the sneaker culture and the careers within that space. Image Nation, um, Cocktail, and Soul Cinema has an event on May 20th, and of course, our Spring Benefit on June 7th. And to access um, educational resources that you can use at home or in the classroom, visit Apollo Education's page, apollotheater.org, um, and click on the resource tab where you'll be able to see um, information for those spaces. We look forward to seeing you um, in person at the world famous uh, Apollo Theater. So on behalf of the Apollo Theater, I wanna say thank you for your support and have a good night. Apollo Theater. My family always tells stories about you. I've heard about the time mom saw Mary J or the wild night she saw Jay-Z. My grandma always tells me about seeing Sarah Vaughn and B.B. King on your stage. The kids at school talk about you too. How you help the community and everyone knows you. When I was little, I would play between your red velvet seats before a show. Now my friends and I have started a band. We're always watching videos of James Brown dancing and Biggie Smalls rhyming. Now that I'm older, I don't run up and down your aisles anymore. But now my friends and I dream of winning amateur night like the greats, of seeing our names on your marquee. So I've got a question for you, Apollo. Will you be there when I'm ready for your stage?